I'm Tijal Mohammed. I'm a PhD candidate at Texas State University. Um, I'll be presenting on behalf of um, Ikechuku Kinsley Okechi, who is um, also a PhD candidate, actually probably a doctor. Uh, he's a doctor now, right? Yeah, he just defended his thesis, so he's gonna be Dr. Okechi. Um, unfortunately, he's not gonna be here, so I'm presenting on his behalf. Um, so the um, PI for for this study is Dr. Anthony Torres from Texas State, and the co-PI is um, Dr. Fred Aguayo from the University of Washington. Um, I'll be presenting on chloride ingress and chloride ion um, induced, sorry. I'll be presenting on chloride ingress and chloride induced corrosion in concrete produced with um, calcium sulfur aluminate cement. And before I start, I would like to mention that this is a smaller project um, out of a larger one with the um, with Texas Department of Transportation, and so just wanted to um, acknowledge them before we start. Um, so these are going to be the outline for today's presentation. So uh, I think I've been I was here in the first session, and everyone was talking about the background of CSA, and then um, the previous speakers here also mentioned the background of CSA. So I'm not going to um, um, dwell on that. But I want to mention, um, I want to bring everyone's attention to some of the challenges that are associated with um, CSA in concrete. And so I kind of want to touch, touch on two durability properties, which is one, the carbonation, and then secondly, the chloride ion ingress. And so with um, carbonation, um, most literature has um, reported low alkaline contents um, in CSA concrete, and then also this potentially um, more rapid rate of carbonation, which leads to a potential breakdown of enterogites um, due to carbonation. And also with chloride ion ingress, um, there is the potential lower chloride binding capacity of this binder and could lead to lower fatal um, salt formation and with high penetrability of chlorides um, could worsen by the carbonation and then the increase of porosity in this concrete. So um, really, why is anyone looking at um, CSA? So because for us, we want to look at CSA in reinforced concrete because we believe um, there is very limited um, application of CSA in concrete. And so um, by looking at reinforced concrete, um, incorporating CSA, we'll be able to, had, we'll be able to add knowledge um, into um, literature as well. And then there is very limited um, long-term durability data on the use of reinforced concrete um, which have CSA. So the main, the main objective of this study is to evaluate the corrosion rate, um, which is due to chloride ion ingress in reinforced um, concrete. And so we believe that um, by looking at this, uh, we believe our study will be able to help the research community to gain a better understanding of um, chloride, ion in corrosion, chloride ion corrosion resistance of reinforced concrete produced with CSA. And then we believe we'll be able to um, gather enough data to be able to provide guidance on the safe and effective use of CSA cement in reinforced concrete. Um, so moving on to the methodology. Um, so in the methodology, we have the table on the right shows the um, mixture proportions and the compressive strength of um, the mixtures done here. We have five total mixtures. We have um, four different types of CSA. CSA1 is acquired from a different um, provider. Meanwhile, CSA2, CSA3, CSA4 are also with the same, um, a different provider. Um, CSA1 is a locally acquired one, and the CSA2, CSA3 are acquired differently, and then they all have different compositions. Um, so when you look at um, CSA1, you can see we have a different water um, cement ratio compared to the other CSAs, and we have a different cement content, and this is because of the manufacturer's, um, it was, we, we use a 0 0.35 for CSA1 because of the manufacturer's recommendation. And then similarly for CSA2, CSA3, and CSA4, 
we use 0 0.38 water cement ratio, and then a lower cement, um, a lower cement because of um, the, the manufacturer and provider's recommendation. Um, also, you can see with OPC2, we use a 0 0.35 water cement ratio, um, a four, um, 446 um, total binder. Um, but moving on to the um, compressive strength shown here, um, if you observe carefully, you can see OPC, OPC1, uh, sorry, the OPC2 gained a very high early strength, and this was intentionally designed for um, this mixture to gain the uh, high early strength. Um, we were able to add some accelerators and HRWR to them to be able to gain that much of strength um, early. And then um, with all the compressive strength, um, OPC2 gained the highest at 69, um, but there is gradual strength um, development in all these, in most of um, these mixtures. So with sample preparation, um, so the samples for this current study were done according to ASTM standard um, G109. And so we did that with a bit of modification. And so what we wanted to look at, we wanted to look at three different series. One, um, the control, which is exactly what this um, standard says. And then we wanted to look at two different um, um, series. And we wanted to look at the introduction of crack into um, this in, into the beam, and then we also wanted to look at um, the effect of carbonated, um, the effect of carbonation when these samples are um, introduced to carbonation, how different or how they are going to affect um, these reinforced steels in here. So the uh, image on the top here um, shows the type of beam that was used. Um, and so I want to point out that the reinforced at the bottom is the cathodic side, and so it doesn't react, um, it, it doesn't lead to corrosion in that regard. And then the top one here is the anodic side, and then that leads to, um, that's where normally, um, usually, um, corrosion, corrosion occurs. And so this is how our sample looked like. And so for series one, as I said, we performed it um, according to the ASCM standard G109. For series two, we introduced um, crack in it, and then the way we, we introduced the crack was to use a one millimeter plastic shim um, with a depth of 10 millimeters at the center of the beam. So as you can see in this image, um, there is that shim, and it goes one, um, 10 millimeters in, and it's at the center of the, um, it's at the, center of the beam. And, um, we make sure that we remove this uh, plastic shim before the final set. And then in series three, we expose the samples to um, accelerated carbonation at a 4% CO2 and 50, 57% relative humidity. And the image here shows um, the chamber that um, the samples were exposed to accelerated carbonation. And um, I want to briefly just show the results of carbonation that, that was acquired prior to um, the measurement of um, corrosion and chloride ion. So for testing, um, for, each, um, for each series we performed two, we had two beams for them. So for testing, uh, we had a 3% sodium chloride on top of the beam. So, which is shown here, you can see. And then um, they, are, um, they are left for two weeks, and then it's a cycle, so every two weeks we have um, take measurements, and then we have like the exposure for, um, we have the exposure repeatedly. And so we wanted to look at two different ways of measuring um, corrosion, and so we looked at um, the half cell potential, which is versus the silver silver chloride, and then we also looked at um, the current density. And so moving on to the results and discussion. Um, so first with the control um, and on the half cell potential. And so we can see, well, first of all, the table here um, characterizes um, the equivalent silver 
silver silver chloride potential for the classification of corrosion activity based on the ASTM standard um, C876. And so based on the table here, we are able to characterize this graph. And so you can see from the graph that um, OPC2 um, and then CSA3 and CSA4 were in the um, low to they, they were in the low, they indicated a low um, risk of corrosion. And then we, um, asso we associated that to um, the high binding capacity of these binders. And then um, CSA2 uh, initially indicated a low risk and then started to drop to an intermediate um, risk of corrosion as well. And then um, uh, CSA1, CSA1, meanwhile, um, showed an intermediate um, risk throughout the testing age. And then it's important to know that um, even though corrosion takes a longer period to occur, um, we were able to test for 21 months. And in the carbonated um, samples for half cell, uh, similar to the um, control, we can see that OPC2 CSA3 and CSA4 were in a similar region. Um, they indicated a low risk to corrosion, and then similarly, we um, associated that to their high binding um, capability. And um, meanwhile, OPC2, meanwhile, um, CSA1 um, showed an intermediate risk, and intermediate risks throughout um, the testing period, and then, um, CSA2 meanwhile showed started from a low risk and then um, we had a huge jump here and I, I couldn't mention it in the beginning but um, the these test parameters that we use are not um, the best they have their challenges that come with it so we believe some there could be some abnorm um, abnormalities with the data that we collect. So we believe here is like an abnormality in the data. That's why we had that huge um, rise. And for the crack samples in um, half, for half cell, um, it had a similar trend um, compared to the carbonated ones and um, the, um, the normal sample. Um, OPC2 and CSA3 and then CSA4 showed a low risk. Um, meanwhile, CSA1 in this case um, showed a low risk to intermediate and then started to um, descend as towards the end of um, testing age. I, and then CSA2 in this regard also showed an intermediate risk to corrosion. And then now switching from the half cell to a different technique, which is the, um, for the current density. Um, so for, for the current density for the normal samples, well, first of all, this is a different table. So this here classifies the risk of corrosion using corrosion current density. So based on this table, we were able to characterize, um, you, uh, we were able to have a deduction from the graph and then conclude on what happens. And so um, OPC2, so here we can see that um, CSA2 and um, CSA2, CSA1 and CSA3 showed a passive throughout, almost throughout the testing age in the early in the beginning, um, in the beginning, CSA3 showed a low to moderate, but in, um, after a few months, started to show, uh, started to show, started to show a passive condition of um, to corrosion, and then um, in the carbonated, in the carbonated um, samples for current um, density, we observed similar trend. Um, CSA1 showed a low to moderate, and then, so CSA1 showed a passive, and I also want to point out CSA2 showed um, a passive, and 
OPC2 was in the um, low to moderate condition. And then on the crack samples, um, that was similar to the carbonated one. OPC was in the low to moderate. And then all the other binders, um, so besides the CSA1, started to show low to moderate, but um, gradually uh, drifted into the um, passive condition. So for our conclusion, um, based on the half cell potential, um, we concluded that the carbonated CSA1, which is a high yellowmite system, showed a high risk corrosion and could be associated with the breakdown of FT phases and their low binding capacity. And then the CSA1 and CSA2 had higher rates of corrosion among the crack samples. And OPC2 demonstrated a low um, corrosion rate due to the high um, binding capacity um, and the presence of Friedel salt. And CSA3, CSA4, both with the um, B light systems, showed a low, low corrosion rate due to the addition of permeability reducing agents in those um, binders. And then, based on the current density, we can see, um, we observed that the cracked, carbonated, and normal samples demonstrated a passive and a low to moderate um, corrosion rate. Um, in the beginning, I want to acknowledge TextThought, uh, as I mentioned earlier on, and some of our cement providers um, for helping us with this research. And if you are interested in our work and want to reach out, yeah, these are the persons interested in the work, so you could contact us. Thank you so much for listening. <laughs>